You're listening to Deal by Deal, a McGuire Woods independent sponsor podcast. Deal by Deal invites you to conversations with experienced independent sponsors and other private equity professionals. Join McGuire Woods partners Greg Hover, Jeff Brooker, and Rebecca Brophy as they explore middle market private equity M&A to provide you with timely insights and relevant takeaways. Hi, this is Greg Hover, and welcome to what we expect to be the final episode of Deal by Deal for 2021. Glad that people could tune in. I know that everyone is very busy with the end of the year closings and mad rush in general. So we will jump right into the content. Excited for this month's episode. To start off, we have Matt Hines of Lockton joining us, and he is in the transactional group there. He's going to chat with us about rep and warranty insurance. And if you're looking at placing RWI during this final stretch of the year, he's got some words of wisdom on that front because it can be a challenge and also has a look ahead of what uh, 2022 and beyond may look like for rep and warranty insurance. So very interesting interview with one of the most active people in the space. Very excited. And after that, we're going to feature an excerpt from our independent sponsor conference in Dallas from late October. It was a huge success, the conference. We had around 900 attendees, capital providers, independent sponsors. One of the highlights I've heard from others was a presentation that Jeff Brooker and myself gave on what is market with respect to independent sponsor deal economics. During that presentation, we walked through all stages of the independent sponsor survey that we took, lots of interesting data points. What we're going to post for this podcast episode is an excerpt where we focus on closing fees and management fees. So we thought this audience would find that interesting. If you have more questions about that survey, podcast audience obviously won't be able to see the survey presented. But if you have questions, you know, contact myself or Jeff Brooker or any other McGuire Woods lawyer. So with that, we'll jump right in and happy holidays and happy new year to everyone. Thanks. For our next segment here, we're happy to have Matt Hines of Lockton on. Matt is a partner and the co-practice leader of the Transaction Liability Group at Lockton. Matt, welcome. Do you want to say a little bit about yourself and about your practice? Yeah, so thanks for having me today. My name is Matt Hines. I am a recovering M&A lawyer, practiced for about five years at Proskauer back in the early 2000s, underwrote uh, rep warranty insurance, tax insurance for years at AIG, and have been now broking rep warranty insurance and tax insurance for just about 12 years. We have a practice group here at Lockton. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is help our clients allocate risk out of M&A transactions into the insurance market to achieve some efficiency, to achieve some, you know, overall deal benefit by using insurance where uh, in lieu of a traditional indemnity or escrow structure, we've got about, you know, 12 people, several, again, former M&A lawyers are also recovering M&A lawyers, tax lawyers on staff. It's a thriving practice. Very, very proud of what we've accomplished. And we're very, very busy, as is everybody else in the M&A market right now. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I'll say that we've worked with the Lockton team on lots of deals, and and you guys do a fantastic job. So, again, thanks for joining us. Wanted to have you on, Matt, because it's an interesting time right now in the M&A market. You know, we're recording this in November of 2021, and everyone is in the throes of the fourth quarter, kind of a deal frenzy right now to get deals closed by the end of the year. And, And a question that we get a lot, and we've been struggling with and working with clients a lot on is, you know, what is the RWI market doing at the end of the year? Is it possible to get insurance for a year-end deal closing? And, you know, realizing that in mid-November, the the ship has probably sailed on many deals. But could you just sort of take us through, maybe at at a high level, the changes that you're seeing from the typical RWI process and terms call it over the last two years versus what you're seeing for, call it, you know, Q4 2021 deals 
And what are the kind of sure. the underlying dynamics in those? So we're in a very interesting market here in Q4. We've now seen probably 12 to 14 months of the most robust M&A activity that most of us in the M&A world have seen in our careers, as well as a developing and maturing insurance market when it comes to claims experience, you know, knowledge of claims and how claims are ultimately adjusted in the rep warranty insurance market. So a combination of carriers, a claim experience, plus the volume that we're seeing, and, and the volume is leading to, you know, bandwidth issues and human capital issues at our carriers. There's just a you know, circumstance where they're just not able to service all of the deals that we're seeing. We've kind of arrived at a scenario where we've got more demand than there is supply from the insurance market. Again, coupled with this increasing claim environment that the carriers are seeing, and it's led to an increase in prices. I mean, when you put those two things together, what you wind up with is carriers being a little bit more selective in the deals that they want to underwrite and also charging a little bit more ultimately for their time. Certainly does not mean that the market is shut down. We're still getting deals done every day. We're getting deals done across the spectrum, you know, all sectors. Some sectors are more challenging. Some deal sizes are more challenging. I would say that deals below 75 or, you know, say 50 million in enterprise value lacking audited financials are particularly challenging to get done right now. Not impossible, but particularly challenging to get done right now. So, you know, we have seen reports about the M&A insurance market, the rep warranty insurance market sort of shutting down for Q4. And I think those reports have been somewhat exaggerated, but it is certainly a more challenging market than it was 18 months ago. No doubt about that whatsoever. Great. That's super interesting. And I want to come back to the deal, you know, in the sub $75 million range, because I know that, that our audience will have an interest in those deals. But just drilling down a little bit further, I had heard, and, and this may not be accurate, that the insurers kind of taken as a whole market have a set level or a target level of insurance they want to write for each year. And that because of the M&A deal activity in 2021, they sort of reached that target level, you know, in the aggregate earlier this year. And so the supply has tightened up. But then in 2021, those sort of targets will reset and we might see an opening up of the market. Speak to that because I'm sure I, I don't have the 100% understanding of it. Yeah, I would say it's it's not exactly that. So it's not that carriers have a set amount of you know limit that they want to put out there or a set amount of premium that they want to bring in. There are, though, sort of guidelines that the carriers work within based on reinsurance arrangements, based on access to the Lloyd's market. And so there's for several carriers, there's some combination of either a premium cap where they're when they hit a certain level of premium underwritten within a year, they're backing reinsurers or they're backing capacity. We'll say that's enough, you know, for, for, for right now. We, you know, we're trying to manage our book. We're trying to manage our exposure across many different lines. And this is the amount of exposure we want to this particular market. And others have limit caps where, they, again, they say we don't want to do more or expose ourselves more than, you know, X limit. So I think it's less that they want to do a certain number of deals or, or write a certain amount of business. I think they try to manage their book and manage their exposure in the context of their overall portfolio. So they're not getting overexposed to any particular product line. Now, not all carriers have that you know, sort of limitation. I mean, we, we deal with several carriers, some larger carriers who don't have those sort of reinsurance restrictions. Some of the MGUs or managing general underwriters with whom we work don't have those restrictions from their backing carriers. So it's a little bit of a mix, but there is certainly a subset of the market that is constrained like that. And so, you know, what that results in is reduced competition, right? Reduced supply on the carrier side. And that does have an impact on the overall marketplace. I would say that the one area or the one sector where these restrictions have been most pronounced is healthcare. You know, our ability mm -hmm. to get deals done with billing and coding, you know, regulatory reps and warranties on them is, you know, definitely constrained right now. There's always a subset of carriers, smaller subset of carriers that can handle that kind of business and underwrite that kind of business. In this current market, several of those carriers who are capable of underwriting that business have hit those those kind of caps, right? And so you've already got a smaller pool and that pool has been somewhat diminished by these uh, you know, reinsurance guidelines. Very interesting and, and really good to hear it straight from from an expert as opposed to a telephone game among lawyers to to hear the exact dynamics of what's causing a tightening here. Super interesting. Even within healthcare, it's not as though that market is completely dead. 
it's just far more challenging. And, and, and that's where you see, you know, lack of supply leading to really noticeable rate inflation, the kind of market where you have to call somebody up and say, at this particular deal, do you think you can handle it? How much capacity do you have left this year? That kind of thing. Whereas normally, again, we get four to five quotes on, on a particular deal. Now, it may be, you know, we may be lucky to scratch out one quote, and it takes quite a bit of scratching and clawing to get that done. Yeah. So when you're thinking about the deal terms that are becoming tougher, is it primarily the amount of the premium? And could you talk about like what were the average premiums before versus what are they in Q4? And then what, mm-hmm. what are the other tough deal terms, exclusions, and, and any other pressure points? Yeah, we generally advise clients on total costs when it comes to a rep warranty placement, so inclusive of all amounts. So premium, taxes, underwriting fees, there's a broker fee involved, you know, uh, bake that in there. That amount, the all-in cost, it was sitting somewhere between 3 to 4% rate online, meaning 3 to 4% of the limit of liability that was being purchased, assuming we were buying a limit or an insurance policy equal to 10% of the enterprise value on a given deal. So for a long time, we were sitting in that 3 to 4% rate online range. Nowadays, we're easily 100 basis points higher than that, if not 150 basis points higher than that. We're typically advising clients, assume 4 to 5%, if not 45 to 5.5% on a total cost basis with those same metrics. You know, so assuming we're covering 10% of enterprise value on you know, your average mid-market M&A transaction. In terms of other responses from the insurance marketplace, I would say as a general rule, carriers in the rep and warranty world are, are sort of paying more deference to underlying insurance, you know, business insurance that, sh- that should be in place. The most noticeable one is certainly cyber insurance. The insurance industry writ large has had, you know, I think a checkered performance when it comes to cyber insurance, meaning that the insurers, I think, have paid out quite a bit of money on claims in the cyberspace. And I think rep and warranty carriers are cautious not to become de facto primary cyber carriers based on a very, very broad cyber or IPIT, you know, type of rep in a merger agreement or in a, a stock purchase agreement. So what they're saying is we'll cover the cyber exposure, but only excess of underlying cyber insurance that should be in place and it should be in place at an adequate limit. Interesting. Interesting. And are you seeing anything specific as far as pushback on exclusions? And I've recently seen a more aggressive pushback on synthetic changes to a purchase agreement that are baked into the policy. Any changes or developments on, on that front? Sure. So I think that's an interesting one, right? Because for a long time, we would get quotes that simply had no modifications to the rep and warranty package whatsoever. I actually have some sympathy for the carriers on this one, because I think as sellers' indemnity obligations have been diminished over time, as rep and warranty insurance has become more ubiquitous, I think sellers have, again, in general, become far more amenable to a broader set of reps than they were when they were standing behind a 10% of enterprise value indemnity cap with an escrow tied to that. So I think as a general rule, rep packages have gotten quite a bit broader than they were five or six years ago on non-insured deals. As a result, the carriers are looking at those rep packages and saying, and again, most of the, the underwriters are former M&A lawyers themselves, they're saying, we're still happy to cover you know, a buyer-friendly set of reps, which is what we've always done. But we're going to cut back on some of the more forward-looking stuff. We're going to cut back on some of the more, you know, really broad language around you know, facts and circumstances and events that may or may not have occurred, that kind of thing, and try to limit reps to something more precise that a seller probably would negotiate if they were actually standing behind the indemnity. I hear you. And, you know, for our audience's reference, this is, the dynamic here is, you know, you have a purchase agreement that's negotiated between the buyer and the seller. And to Matt's point, at times it can be somewhat seller-friendly if RWI is in play. And then so the insurer will, in the policy, say, notwithstanding what's in this purchase agreement, you know, you need to add in X, Y, Z words to this rep and this rep. Based on my experience, that used to be a year or two ago, those synthetic edits were really for, you know, almost misses by the parties or or really seller-friendly overreaches and kind of forward-looking statements that were in the reps. And now, recently, I'm seeing that they're almost kind of jump ball provisions that arm's length buyers and sellers may have come out one way or another. But again, 
right. kind of jump balls. And the insurers are saying, no, we want that to be on the buyer-friendly side of that jump ball. Yeah, I think we're seeing that pendulum swinging, you know, in real time. I think six months ago, we probably saw a, a more aggressive set of comments from those carriers than we're seeing right now, even though we're still in the midst of, you know, a hard market, as, as we call it again, and where carriers are trying to reset on some of the stuff that they've given in the past. As a general rule, you know, I think you're right. We really shouldn't be sort of falling out where you know, on the jump ball provision, the carriers are modifying the rep so that it's a very, very seller-friendly sort of rep at the end of the day. But some of this is also in, informed by claim activity, right? I mean, so the carriers have seen a lot of claims around material contract reps in particular, and some material contract either being canceled or terminated or, or modified and not scheduled and not notified to the buyer pre-closing. And all of a sudden, you've got either a recurring expense that's been increased or a recurring line of revenue that's been decreased. As a result of that, folks are making claims on a diminution in value basis and saying that this impacts the EBITDA upon which I base my you know, pricing multiple. And as such, and this is not just a direct loss of X dollars. It's, you know, those dollars that, you know, we can actually calculate times the multiple that I paid for this business. And so they've seen some very, very chunky claims on those in particular. So this all leads to a material contract rep seeing, you know, modifications where written notice is the standard that they want to see for, you know, a change to a contract as opposed to just a uh, notice standard or, or some sort of limitation on oral notice, that kind of thing. That's a fair point. And I have some sympathy there. Even though on this podcast, our, whether our listeners are buyers or sellers, we, we typically don't have sympathy for the insurers, but I, I hear you on that point. <laughs> um, so to wrap things up, I, I want to cover a couple final points, though. So you mentioned as we're sitting here in November in a white hot market, deals that are under $75 million to $50 million are particularly challenging to bind RWI coverage. What would be some tips? for people that are transacting in that deal size space as they try to look to RWI? I would say to get out early on those. And this is a very, very self-serving statement, but make sure you've got a broker that's got some pulse, you know, in the in the insurance market, if you do need to get that done and, you know, who's got some ability to talk to a carrier and, you know, again, make a phone call and say, I, I really, you know, need help on this deal. It's a very good client. And, you know, I think this is a good one for you ultimately. That sort of thing actually is important because of the volume that we've seen. I think there are some carriers that are limiting their responses to some of the distribution channels, namely brokers that are producing quite a bit more business for them. And it's just, again, it's just a supply and demand thing. It's not to disparage anybody or anybody's practice, but they only have so many hours in the day to respond. And so they're limiting their responses to the folks that, you know, ultimately bring them the most business. So I would say get out of it, you know, well in advance of your signing date. Make sure you've got somebody on the scene who who does this every day, who actually, you know, does rep warranty insurance for a living. If it is a deal that does not feature audited financials, again, going to be much more challenging. You're just going to have to have a QV. You're probably not going to get away with some sort of internal diligence on a non-audited financial target. Those are really, I think, the key points. Again, it's not a dead market by any stretch of, of the imagination, but it is taking a little bit more time and it's taking a little bit more effort to get some deals done, particularly in that size range. That makes sense. And I'll echo your sentiment. So it's not, you know, quote, self-serving. I, I think that for our listeners who are, are doing deal by deal economics, being able to leverage a broker that is a major player in the space, such as locked in, and there are a couple others, but there's a handful of major players in the RWI space. And there's a lot of other players. So totally agree with you there. As a final question, as you look to Q1, I know that a lot of us deal lawyers, as we're working around the clock, have been really looking to Q1 as our light at the end of the tunnel where things might slow up a little bit, given maybe some pressures from a tax perspective may lessen or they may not. But in any event, the flip side of the coin is that things may not change all that much in, in Q1 as far as m and activity. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of deals that are already slipping. And other than some tax pressures, we, we don't see a ton of other reasons that this white hot market is just going to slam the brakes on. So with that intro, what do you see ahead for Q1 in 2022 as far as RWI goes? Yeah, I think I, I was actually talking to some folks about this the other day. I, I tend to think personally, and this is more based on gut instinct than anything else. I mean, 
everything is cyclical. And I, I do think that we're at the zenith of, a, as you said, a white hot market right now. And I do think things will slow at some point. How slow things get and whether this is close to the new normal and what we should expect in terms of M&A activity going forward, I think is the real question. I do think there was some tax concern baked into the activity that we've seen. I think some of that concern has you know now settled out and there's a little bit more clarity around the ongoing tax legislation that may be forthcoming. The one thing in our market that's certainly of note is you know, we talked before about some premium and limit caps that folks had or capital constraints. Those should go away January 1. So we should have and the human capital issue that I mentioned earlier is not going to go away, right? There needs to be an influx of talent into the rep and warranty insurance underwriting space, I think, in order for us to service our clients' needs going forward. So that issue will still be there. But in terms of capacity constraints or anything like that, that will go away as of January 1 for most carriers. I fully expect us to be able to service all the deals that that come down the pike in Q1, whether we stay at this rate of activity. Or actually, I don't think it's a matter of whether. I think it's you know how long will we stay at this rate of activity into 2022. That remains to be seen, but you know we'll be here ready, willing, and able to service that market. Great. And so, specifically, you think some of the pricing pressure and exclusion pressure is going to come off healthcare deals and also the sub $75 million deals? You think the dynamic of having to kind of call a friend on the smaller deals may go away a bit in 2022? From a pricing perspective, I do expect there to be, you know, a bit of a leveling off and a decrease over time. I don't think it's going to be drastic, though. I mean, I think rate increase, as with most hard markets, it it increases very, very quickly. And then it's sort of a slow bleed. You know, the air is slowly let out of the balloon over the course of a cycle where rates decline a little bit. I don't know that we will get back to an extended period of rates that we saw, you know, four years ago, three or four years ago, where we were sub 3% on most deals, you know, two, two and a half percent or two and three quarters percent. I think there's enough claim activity now where CARES are looking at that band of rate as being challenging for them ultimately. I, I think, you know, longer term settling in somewhere in the three to four percent range is probably where the market settles out in terms of client appetite and client willingness to take on that expense as well as carrier needs from a profitability perspective. But it, it's it's not going to be overnight. It's certainly not going to be, you know, we're not going to flip the switch on January one and all of a sudden see, you know, three percent rates again. Got it. That makes sense. Matt, really appreciate your time. This this has all been super interesting, and I could talk to you for another half hour about this, but I think we've all got to get back to this uh, white hot market that we've been talking about. <laughs> so again, thanks so much for joining. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, and uh, always happy to do it. And uh, good luck to everybody out there doing deals. So now we will, as promised, transition to an excerpt from a presentation on What's Market from our McGuire Woods Independent Sponsor Conference held in Dallas this past October 19th and 20th. Again, this presentation was from Jeff Brooker and myself. Thanks. Okay, so next up is the, 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 one of the other pillars here is the closing fee. And we're going to use the, the nomenclature here, closing fee. It's kind of loaded from a regulatory perspective because of broker-dealer regulations and most independent sponsors are not affiliated with the broker-dealer. So I think this is one that is really important from the early stages when you are thinking about your LOI and what kind of language goes into it, that you are consulting an attorney and making sure that you're kind of putting the best face forward as well as structuring things in a way or at least understanding the risks that you're taking. So I wanted to reiterate that. And then Maybe I take a step back. Everyone, I think, understands what a closing fee is. It's you know a fee paid at closing. And it can be paid in cash or it can be paid in equity. And there's various strategies that we can take around tax to try to minimize the, the tax that's paid in the year that the closing fee is paid. You want to consult with an attorney upfront, I think, to help them. There's There's a few different answers that you can come up with. They've got different economic results, but uh, also different risk tolerances. You definitely need to understand some folks might advise on, on some approaches that have significant risk. And I think you, wanna, you really want to think about that and what is the right answer for you before you really structure your fee. I would reiterate that. And, and I would say that 
we at McGuire Woods are aware of all the structures out there and can talk you through them and, and talk through the you know potential risks involved with yeah, some of the and, structure. Right. I mean, yeah, Greg and I were talking before this and they said, oh, do you know what you know, X firm is out there, how, how they structure? Yes, we are aware of all the different ways <laughs> to do this and can counsel you through them. If something sounds too good to be true, it often is. And there's usually risk to that. You know, the IRS wants their piece and there are permissible ways that we can try to avoid paying them their, their piece in the first year. But there are limits and being mindful of those is important. So how's the, the closing fee percentage calculated? The vast majority of deals here are they're calculated based on enterprise value. So an aggregate enterprise value of the deal. So if the target's enterprise, is you know if the value is fifty million, then the the right base value to calculate is fifty million. It's a pretty small number of deals that do other things. You know, seven percent based on all capital raise, and then ten percent based on the the equity capital raise. So I think definitively an enterprise value basis for the fee is market. So the next slide, size of the closing fee. I'll let everyone just kind of look at and digest the results, but you'll you'll see. The most common band here is between 1.5 up to 2.49 as far as a percentage of enterprise value for a closing fee. If you were to further dive into the data, the 2% results for deals from 10 million to 50 million, 2% of enterprise value is the most common result that we saw, which is consistent with what we see in our practice as well. One item to note, I mean, as, as alluded to, is the decision of like, there is this closing fee that's going to be paid, the decision of whether to roll all or a portion of that into the equity of the go forward company. Looking at the data, we found about 40% of independent sponsors rolled the entire closing fee into the deal and with the remainder rolling a portion or, or none. The next slide is, is the flip side in a sense of are there closing fees that are going to be paid to the equity capital provider as well. The data shows that in a majority of deals, there are no closing fees paid to the equity capital provider. This is another one where if, if you dive into the data and look at our private equity firms more likely to take the closing fee versus family offices, I think consistent with our practice, you would probably see that it skews to be more common that a, that a PE firm would, would take some fees. But again, the, the majority of capital writers are not taking fees at the closing. Great. So moving along to management fees. So for those of you unfamiliar, this is a, an annual or more commonly a quarterly fee paid by the portfolio company post-closing to the independent sponsor and potentially to the equity provider for ongoing private equity consulting expertise. It forms, as many know, sort of the, the base case economics that the independent sponsor will receive in all but sort of dire scenarios where perhaps the credit agreement goes into default. And, and then we'll talk about what happens with respect to the management fee being shut off, the promote being the upside uh, economic piece. So diving into the data, You'll see that the, the EBITDA-based model is by far the most common. So the two ways to measure this are the parties can agree to a straight dollar fee, call it 200000 and pay that annually. Or more commonly, you look at the operating EBITDA of the business and measure that as a, as a percentage. There was a small number of uh, data points where instead of EBITDA-based, it was a revenue-based fee. But I think there were only three or four responses of that nature. So we're really just talking about EBITDA versus straight dollar amount. There was a very small percentage where there was no, no management fee at all. And this is talking about the management fees paid to independent sponsors here, to be clear. So the next slide, this talks about what in the EBITDA-based model, what are the management fees that we're seeing? Pretty resounding data set at 5% being market. So really, there are parts of the survey that are less clear. We'll talk about the carried interest. There's not a clear-cut market response, but we do see 5% at 
EBITDA based management fee being pretty clear. And uh, Jeff, I may have stepped on your slide a little bit, but uh, no, it's all right. Further? Yeah, no, this is definitely one of the most interesting slides I think in the presentation because it's it's one of the core pieces of you know what is what is market. Five percent really resoundingly came across as is the the market and everything else is kind of widely dispersed. One thing that's not reflected on the slide is caps and floors. Our data does dig into that. The survey dug into it, and we have a lot of responses to to that. You know, we're gonna we're, we'll elaborate on that in the the fuller published piece. But typically, you know, even if there's a five percent management fee, it's very common to have a floor. So that way, the the independent sponsor knows that they're at least going to get something, even if the company is is puttering along and, and maybe not hitting it, the an amount that's necessary for them to keep the lights on, and then usually a cap as well. So correspondingly, if the company is is going gangbusters, there's some upper limit to how much money is going toward the management fee. And so, as I said, we you know, the published paper will have a little bit more detail on that, but. Wanted to flag that you know it doesn't mean five percent like no matter how big the company gets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because as you think about the three different pillars of the economic model, they're also interlinked and dependent upon one another. That we found with the caps and floors, it didn't really make sense to say this percent of deals had caps versus this percent of floors because you got to think: was there a cap and a floor? Was there just a cap? And so I think we'll have more to come on on that topic. Yeah, that's right. The data was a little bit. Sometimes when the data got a little bit difficult to present in a this type of format, we're we're just punting to the larger the larger presentation. This is a straight dollar uh, management fee when it's not EBITDA based, as we discussed before. EBITDA based is the most common model. You know, you need to recall the deal sizes that we're predominantly working with here. I think it was two thirds in the ten to fifty million. And then 75 or 80 percent under 75 million, and so when you have to in your mind kind of overlay that with this to help rationalize what that is, what these dollar amounts are relative to the deal size. But you'll see, you know, basically 100 to 300 is was by far the most common. Two thirds of the deals in that that space. The next data point relates. You know, we just talked about the management fees, the independent sponsor. Then the next question is well. Is the equity capital provider also taking similar management fees? And the data showed that the vast majority, there were no ongoing management pay, fees paid to the equity capital providers. And we think, you know, this is reflective of the value add that independent sponsors are bringing to the portfolios, that they are the ones that are recognized with, with the ongoing management fee for their services. This is one where if you were to dive into the data further, you would probably see some differences between whether private equity firms are going to want to take a management fee versus family offices. But in broad strokes, this was the result. And again, we, we thought it spoke to the, the value of the independent sponsors. We alluded to the concept of you know, this, this management fee is an important part of the investment and really only material items and events are going to cause the management fee to stop being paid to the independent sponsor. One common interplay is with respect to the credit agreement. And you know what occurs if the company is no longer able to perform under the credit agreement? As you'll see, the most common result here is one that is beneficial to the independent sponsor where the payments pause. So it's not the most beneficial outcome for the independent sponsor. That would be if the fees are not blocked, even if default. So we only saw that in 6% of the results. But the most common one is that the fees are blocked while there's an event of default. But during that time period, they accrue and there is not a cap on that accrual. It is, you know, the second most common result is that the fees are blocked and they accrue, but then there is a cap that is agreed while that occurs. Yeah, and then the logic behind that one is if the company's scuffling along and it can't pay the management fee, that there should be some upper limit on how much can accrue that is effectively diluting the rest of the equity before we we say uh, you know enough is enough, the dilution is is enough, and, and we're going to apply a cap. It, it's interesting data. For sure. Yeah, yeah, and the other interesting point is that in only two percent of the deals. Did the management agreement completely terminate upon an event of default 
under the credit agreement. So again, it's, it's a very important part of the economic model for independent sponsors. It should pause and there should be negotiations about what happens with respect to that. But the, the termination result is, is not market, as you can see. Great. I hope you found the excerpt of the Independent Sponsor Conference to be helpful. And I also hope that everyone found the discussion around rep and warranty insurance from the Lockton team to be similarly helpful. Again, good luck to everyone as we finish out the year strong and happy holidays and happy new year. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Deal by Deal a McGuire Woods Independent Sponsor Podcast. To learn more about today's discussion and our commitment to the independent sponsor community, please visit our website at mcguirewoods.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This podcast was recorded and is being made available by McGuire Woods for informational purposes only. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that McGuire Woods makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in the podcast. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect those of McGuire Woods. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state and should not be construed as an offer to make or consider any investment or course of action.